Good morning. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlanta Council. I thank you all for coming this morning. We have a very good event, I believe. Uh, we're going to be talking about the political future of Russia. And we have an excellent cast of characters. Uh, we have, to my immediate left, uh, Maria uh, Snegova. Uh, you have a you have a bio, so I will not go over uh, what, what, what her background, uh, but an excellent scholar in the field of Russian foreign policy. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Fagan, Mark Fagan, to when he's left, uh, a, a lawyer who defended uh, Pussy Ride and Nadia Savchenko, and for that was considered um, dangerous to authorities, and therefore they claim that he's no longer a lawyer in good standing. And then we have to his left, um, Ivan um, Tuturin, Tuturin, I mean, um, with Free Russia, an organization which does very important work following what is happening in Russia today. So I I'm going to start with a few questions for our panel, and then we'll give you all a chance to, to ask them um, your own questions. Um, Ivan, it seems that Mr. Putin's domestic troubles are increasing. Um, there is real unhappiness over pension reform. Um, Levada Center polls show that a majority think that things in Russia are not going well. Is this simply a small periodic doldrums, or is this the start of something more important? And I need to take, test the mic, I apologize. So. One, two, three, mic's on. Uh, no. Значит, безусловно, мы наблюдаем некое снижение там, падения и поддержки как бы, Путина. Yes, we see the uh, drop in the level of uh, support uh, for Putin. На мой взгляд, это обусловлено рядом причин. Одна, конечно, то, о чем вы сказали, это непопулярная пенсионная реформа. And I think it's based on a number of reasons. One, uh, you have mentioned already the unpopular pension reform. Uh, 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 в целом мы наблюдаем как бы ухудшение экономической ситуации в России. But overall, we see the worsening of the economic situation in Russia. Но я бы сказал, что uh, свидетельством uh, чего являются вот эти как бы рейтинги, это на мой взгляд uh, некое uh, снижение фактора Крыма. То есть крымский консенсус по-прежнему существует, но он не выполняет той функции, которую выполнял начиная с 2014 года. And so the drop in ratings uh, also shows the change uh, when it comes to the, the Crimean factor. The consensus around uh, Crimea still exists, but it doesn't play the same role as it played uh, <coughs> uh, that it played in uh, 2014 during the annexion of the Crimea. Как правило, говоря о ухудшении или снижении рейтинга Путина, концентрирует внимание на экономических проблемах, но есть фактор, который, на мой взгляд, не менее существенный. Мы видим нарастание напряженности в национальных республиках. So usually uh, the lowering, uh, the drop in Putin's ratings um, usually is attributed to economic problems, but uh, there is also another factor at play, which is the rising tensions uh, in uh, Ethnic republics. Вот эта проблема между Чечней и Ингушетией. Мы видели столкновение в Кабардино-Балкарии. So the the tension between the Republic of Chechnya and the Republic of Ingushetia. We saw clashes in uh, Кабардино-Балкария. Uh, пока что в ручном режиме власти удается, в общем, все эти uh, проблемы погасить, нейтрализовать. Но в целом мы видим uh, по uh, ряду факторов uh, в целом как бы ухудшение ситуации для Путинского режима. And so uh, the Putin regime, by micromanaging, can uh, so far succeeded in uh, neutralizing these uh, factors and uh, kind of extinguishing the, these problems. But overall, we see the, the worsening of the situation for the Putin regime. При этом совершенно очевидно, что на данный момент вот эти нарастающие проблемы, о которых я сказал ранее, они не преобразуются в какой-то политический протест. At the same time, it is obvious that these uh, problems, rising problems that I have mentioned, uh, have already mentioned, do not uh, turn into a political protest. 
При увеличении в целом всевозможных акций протеста и недовольства в разных частях страны, значит, какого-то организованного протеста с определенными четким политическим требованием мы не видим. So while we see increasing number of protests uh, and protest actions in uh, various parts of the country, we don't see any, any organized uh, protest movement yet. Ну и последняя проблема, которая uh, является как бы такой uh, существенной для Путина на, uh, там, на длинной дистанции, это, конечно, проблема легитимности. Он у власти 20 лет, и, как бы, очевидно, есть определенные категории россиян, которые просто устали от единоличного управления Путина столь долгого. And the last problem uh, is the, that is uh, substantial for Putin is, the, is his legitimacy. He's been ruling uh, for 20 years, and um, it's just a number of people are simply tired of it. Uh, для меня, как бы, у меня нет сомнений, что Путин будет uh, пытаться оставаться после 24 года, что он будет пытаться сохранять власть в своих руках, как бы, до конца. I have no, uh, no doubt that Putin will try to preserve his power past uh, 2024, that uh, he will try to hold on to power until the very end. Ну и в этой ситуации, долгого пребывания у власти, uh, разные события совершенно неожиданным образом могут привести к uh, поднятию протестных настроений. So, and in this situation, his uh, stay in power, uh, all sorts of different types of events uh, can lead uh, to the rise of uh, protest uh, actions. Как это было в конце 2011 -го года? Uh, поводом послужили uh, uh, значит, нарушение фальсификации на выборах uh, uh, в Госдуму. It has already happened in 2011. The cause was uh, the falsifications during the elections uh, towards the Duma. No, on my view, the main reason for this was the decision of uh, Putin to maintain his power and go into a new presidential term. But the main impulse for that was uh, Putin's decision to stay in power and uh, to get uh, to to get elected for the new presidential term. Thank, thank you. Uh, it, it's funny. Uh, sometimes when people do the right thing, it, it creates problems. And um, I've been very critical of Putin's policies in many respects, but I think what he's done with pension reform might be something that actually be good for Russia, but it leads to political problems. But. Uh, what we've also seen with his leadership is the tax on long-distance truckers, a tax that was put in place so he could pay off one of his pals. So this, this, is, a, this is obviously bad policy. Is this, is this connection understood in Russia? Is that a political problem for Mr. Putin? Uh, на мой взгляд, такая связь понимается, но, разумеется, не всеми. In my opinion, uh, this connection is understood, uh, but uh, naturally by not all. Uh, ну, просто у людей есть проблемы с доступом информации. То есть они получают uh, информацию в искаженном виде и об этих вещах не знают. But uh, people have issues with access to information. People receive information in a distorted way, and then uh, it uh, has its impact on understanding. И это не единичный случай, когда uh, для поддержки своих друзей uh, используются uh, как бы ресурсы внутри экономики российской. And this is not a single uh, occasion when, uh, in order to support uh, friends or pals. Uh, the resources of the Russian economy, uh, resources of Russian economy are put to use. Опять, пока что это не дает, в этом нет какого-то политического выражения, мы не видим каких-то протестов. Даже дальнобойщики как бы активно начали свою деятельность, борьбу за свои права, но это все достаточно быстро сошло на нет. At the same time, we don't see any political expression of it, uh, even uh, when it comes to long-distance truckers uh, and their uh, standing for their rights, uh, you, you did see an emergence of it, but uh, 
did not see full fledged political protest. Но в целом проблема как бы коррупции, злоупотребления в российской власти, она, э, на мой взгляд, многими россиянами осознается как действительно проблема. И я бы отметил роль Алексея Навального и его команды в, в актуализации этой темы. Uh, but I would say overall the issue of corruption, the problem for abuse of power is understood as a, as a problem within Russia. And here I must mention the work of uh, Mr. Navalny and his team in uh, keeping uh, this, uh, these issues relevant. Thank you. I'll, I'd just like to make one, one more point here. The problem of helping the cronies at the expense of the Russian economy is evident um, with Nord Stream 2. And it's unfortunate that this point has not been noted much in the West, and certainly, of course, not in Russia. Um, Sberbank, right? Sberbank had a report a few months ago which said that Nord Stream 2 is bad for the Russian economy, but very good for people who are politically well-connected. And uh, it's this is something which we need to explore a little bit more. Or not necessarily here. Okay. <laughs> Mark, you've represented defendants that are not well liked in the Kremlin. And I mentioned already uh, Pussy Riot and Nadia Savchenko, but there are also, of course, the Crimean Tatars, who have been severely repressed by, by the Kremlin since the seizure of Crimea. Um, in your judgment, what is the role of the criminal justice system in propping up Mr. Putin's regime? Но э, дело в том, что вообще говорить о судебной системе э, в России необходимо только в контексте ее типологии. So, speaking of the judicial system uh, of Russia makes sense, uh, the discussion of it uh, makes sense only within the context of its typology. Uh, это тип uh, судебной системы, свойственный авторитарным системам. So the court system is typical uh, for the authoritarian systems. Uh, в, ну, скажем, более или менее uh, в стадии развития, схожей с тем, что было на начальном этапе в нацистской Германии. And uh, it's uh, and the system is is at the stage of development uh, which is similar, more or less, to what we had uh, in the early stages and beginning of the development of Nazi Germany. Uh, суды, фольксуды, значит, 30 х годов очень похожи по uh, степени своей зависимости от uh, политического режима, от отсутствия uh, uh, надлежащих гарантий, которые обеспечивают независимое судопроизводство, очень похоже на то, что вот было в нацистской Германии на самом начальном этапе. So, folks, uh, folks courts in the 1930s in Germany are very similar uh, to what we have in Russia due to its dependency on the political system and lack of guarantees uh, for the independent, uh, independent uh, judicial function. Uh, that's what we see. Если суд и, скажем так, если мы подразумеваем судебную систему в целом, она предполагает весь процесс, да, значит, и его участников. Если суд, следствие, обвинение значит уже давно достаточно находились э, в ситуации э, значит объединения в нечто единое целое то за последние годы рухнула и независимая адвокатура как институт это тоже важно сказать что ее нет так же как собственно говоря не было в нацистской германии уже к концу 30-х годов Поскольку это важно, поскольку именно адвокатура является неким представителем общества против государства. Сегодня адвокатура это уже является частью большой государственной машины. Participants of the court system, we see not only merging of the prosecutorial uh, function with the court system, uh, but also vanishing of independent uh, defense uh, function. And uh, so, and that's uh, very similar to what we had uh, in Nazi Germany, vanishing uh, of the independent uh, defense. Uh, 
такого типа систем в континентальной системе права, к какой российская, конечно, относится, а, а, обрушение всех этих институтов в конечном итоге ведет а, а, к полной аннигиляции конституционной ветви власти, какой судебная, конечно, является. So, uh, within the Russia, the destruction of uh, these institutions uh, within the continental law, and Russian law is part of the continental law. Um, it's th this... Uh, Annihilation, just their self-liquidation. So, basically, it leads to an annihilation and uh, self-destruction. И если еще какое-то время в начале десятых годов э, в политических делах по этой категории дел, публичность как элемент защиты, э, международное давление играли роль, то если вы заметили, э, ну вот в моих делах так происходило в деле Пусси э, в деле Greenpeace или э, в деле Савченко, то сейчас вот на примере Сенцова мы видим, что международное давление уже вообще не играет никакой роли. То есть невозможно использовать публичные институты защиты для того, чтобы э, добиться, так сказать, по политическим делам э, спасения того или иного подзащитного. Это очень показательно. So, uh, while in uh, 2010 there was still uh, there was still openness that could could uh, could have been used, also uh, international pressure played its role. Um, in uh, cases, uh, in Pussy Riot case, in Nadezhda Savchenko case, uh, but uh, what we see uh, with the Sintsov case that uh, international pressure has uh, no impact uh, whatsoever, and uh, this uh, this is a significant uh, change. Произошло это во многом потому, что Москва в нынешнем ее виде не чувствительно глухо к этим призывам, поскольку ей больше нечего терять. Кремль находится под санкциями, и это дает ему возможность, так сказать, игнорировать свои репутационные издержки. То есть они больше не боятся того, что упорство в таких политических делах, делах политических заключенных, чревато какими-то последствиями на международном уровне. So what's happening is that now uh, with uh, Mo that Moscow is impervious uh, to uh, these uh, pressures, being under sanctions, it's not concerned anymore for the for its reputational risks uh, for losing uh, reputation, and, um, and uh, they have uh, nothing to lose at this point, and this is the biggest change. Uh, есть и международный правовой аспект. Дело в том, что если вы видели, все последние годы Россия э, последовательно э, игнорировала свои обязательства в области международного права и соблюдение обязательств по исполнению решений международных судебных институций. Это касается и Третейского суда в Гаге по поводу иска ЮКОСа, это касается решений Европейского суда по правам человека, многих решений. Были и законодательные введены нормы, например, закон о конституционном суде, по которому часть решений Европейского суда Россия может не исполнять, в том числе и в части компенсации материального ущерба. Сегодня я констатирую, что Россия находится вне зоны регулирования международных норм права, вопреки даже своей 15 статье Конституции. And, uh, with uh, Russia not uh, Russia has been consistent in uh, not uh, following its uh, international obligation international legal obligations uh, when it comes to the international law and we see that in uh, Yuka's case we see that at uh, in the European Court on Human Rights not uh, following the decisions of the European Court uh, on Human Rights We see also um, with the decision of the Constitutional Court, uh, which has decided that it is uh, legal sometimes not to follow the decisions uh, of the European Court. And we see that uh, happening in violation of uh, Article, 15. Article 15 of the Constitution of the Russian Federation. Да, в статье 15 сказано о том, что нормы международного права имеют примат по отношению к нормам, действиям нормам национальным. Это означает, что решение 
международных судов должны исполняться неукоснительно, даже если они противоречат решениям судов национальных. Сейчас идет гигантская дискуссия, так сказать, внутри аппарата власти, выходить ли из Совета Европы или нет. Они действительно этот вопрос серьезно обсуждают. So right now there is a, a mass discussion uh, within uh, the powers whether to leave the Council of Europe, and uh, there is a, and they're truly seriously discussing this. Этот шаг будет означать уже окончательный бесповоротный разрыв с универсальной юстицией в том виде, в котором э, она каким-то образом связана с Россией вообще. То есть Россия таким образом изолируется полностью уже от э, даже видимости э, присутствия ее национального права в международном праве. Would do the final step and uh, the irreversible step of leaving uh, the universal justice system, and thus Russia would uh, isolate itself, and there will be no longer even a pretense of uh, having a connection between the Russian uh, legal system and the, the international law. И, конечно, последствием этого будет uh, отказ от моратория на смертную казнь, пресловутая вот эта шестая статья. Я допускаю такое развитие событий в случае социального обострения. Москва может отказаться от моратория на смертную казнь и вернуть смертную казнь в качестве пенологии в те составы, в которых она и без этого уже находится, состав Уголовного кодекса, и право применения ее возобновится. Это вполне реальные перспективы. Я не разделяю мнение Алексея Навального, который считает, что... Россия вряд ли, Кремль вряд ли, так сказать, покинется от Европы. Мне так не кажется, это, это не самоочевидная вещь. Потому что это двусторонний процесс. Совет Европы тоже ставит ультимативные условия Москве. Дело не только в уплате взносов в Совет Европы, а, но и в других вещах относительно исполнения решений СПЧ, процессуальной части и так далее. То есть э, Россию могут и исключить из Совета Европы. Но это будет не предпосылка, а следствие, понимаете? So, uh, in, in this case, uh, if Russia were to leave the Council of Europe, um, it is possible that there will be a return uh, to capital punishment, and the moratorium that exists on capital punishment will be no longer in place, and then uh, the capital punishment will be returned back to the criminal code and will be used uh, in court practice. Here, I... Uh, disagree with Mr. Navalny, who thinks that Kremlin will not uh, be, the Kremlin will not be leaving the Council of Europe. There's also, it's a two-way process, and the Council of Europe uh, is also uh, takes, uh, takes strict positions, and it's not only about uh, non-payment of uh, fees or not following the decisions on the European Council of Human Rights. But uh, Russia, Russia might leave, uh, might leave the, the Council of Europe, uh, and that might happen not as a consequence, but as an initiative. Констатирую я здесь только одно, что процесс ухудшения ситуации и в смысле репрессий, и нарушений прав человека, связанный как раз с вот этой самоликвидацией, окончательной уже разрушением судебной системы, как независимой конституционной ветви власти, этот процесс, в общем, вступил в какую-то решающую фазу, и последствием этого будет очень печальное, прежде всего, для самих обывателей, для русских обывателей, потому что утрачивание возможности, хотя бы даже формальной, к защите своих прав, она приведет к еще более печальным последствиям, с моей точки зрения. And so I think that uh, we have the worsening of the situation and um, that at this point the repressions and the destruction of human rights uh, might uh, get the process to reach its uh, decisive phase and uh, the results will be quite bad uh, for, uh, for just regular Russians, Russian common people and uh, they will not have the, the 
protections that, that have existed. Потому что само даже uh, осознание uh, того, что все-таки существует какая-то наднациональная инстанция в области прав человека в виде Европейского суда по правам человека, конечно, не была решающим фактором, который помогал добиваться защиты своих прав в суде. Но это больше было для судей, для самой судебной системы некоторое обременение. Они всегда с оглядкой смотрели на то, что их решения в национальных судах могут быть теоретически оспорены в ЕСПЧ. Если этого э, угрозы над ними не будет, то так сказать, э, этой оглядки на суд, Европейский суд по правам человека, то э, судебная система будет действовать еще более жестко, еще более безапелляционно и так сказать, уверенно нарушать права человека, как она делает сейчас, но с этой оговоркой. So right now, uh, with, the, with the disappearance of the supranational body and the, uh, and the European Courts on Human Rights, uh, the, the situation will change because the, for, the, for uh, the current judges, there is at least some check on their work. Uh, so they, uh, they uh, look at the, that at least there is a theoretical possibility that the European Council on Human Rights might uh, challenge their decisions. And with the disappearance of that check, the court system, the judicial system, will be even uh, more confident uh, violator of uh, human rights. Oh, me, sir. Thank you. OK. Maria. Uh, Ivan already mentioned that the, what he called the Crimean consensus is not as powerful as it once was. Uh, do you, but we all understood that as the Russian economy tanked, uh, Putin began to focus on the foreign policy side as a means of legitimization. Uh, how do you see the foreign policy power as a political legitimizing force today in Russia? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. It's a big pleasure uh, to be here as usual. So just a reminder to our audience that throughout his uh, really never-ending rule, uh, Putin's legitimacy has indeed been based upon different sources. So since his coming to power in 2000s on until 2011-12, the key foundation of Putin's support relied on uh, increasing well-being of the citizens, right? In fact, Putin certainly claimed uh, that he somewhat created the Russian middle class, although, of course, that credit probably uh, is more, uh, goes towards the oil prices rather than his, uh, his own achievements. Uh, what happened in 2011 and 12 is that uh, his own middle class that he created throughout this uh, prolific uh, times uh, of 2000s re rebelled against him, which Putin interpreted as a sort of betrayal of this part. And since 2012, uh, since him coming to power again, uh, you see that we are reorienting of the Kremlin uh, shift towards a different type of constituency. Certainly, this constituency already was part of the Putin majority, but uh, you see this trend becoming particularly noticeable uh, starting 2012. More traditional paternalistic population, there is more uh, suffering from post-imperial syndrome. And this is uh, uh, where you start observing a very traditionalist uh, trend in Russian policies, reorientation towards nationalism, uh, conservatism, anti, very sharp anti-Westernism, and of course, uh, eventually culminating in Crimea annexation uh, and war in Ukraine. Uh, the war in Ukraine and Crimea in particular certainly gave uh, Putin a huge boost. That's nothing new. Uh, many observers spoke of the so-called Teflon effect, the Teflon rating, where no matter what happened in Russia for about two years, really had zero impact on the unusually high levels of approval of Putin's. Interestingly, um, importantly, Russian system is based upon Putin's rating, as they say. That means that Putin is essentially the key institution whose approval drives approval for most of other institutions in Russia, uh, be it, I don't know, parliament, military, all other, other state institutions, and as well as approval for other officials. Uh, what you see is uh, after 2014 is actually for the first time that relationship becoming less resilient. 
uh, where Putin's approval keeps uh, staying strong while other approval of other institutions decline. Now that effect lasted for about two years and since the end of 2015 we observe a slow erosion of the Crimea effect. So this starting again slow, very hard, hardly noticeable, but yet nonetheless some decline in the approval. Uh, that continues until uh, this summer. Now what happened in uh, this summer is of course the retirement age uh, increase, a very unpopular reform in Russia, which actually result, it resulted in fundamental drop in Putin's approval. Um, so if you take the Levada uh, data, uh, which is essentially the only in the, one of the very few remaining independent polling agencies in Russia, is that in less than a year, Com uh, so com uh, in September 2018, comparing to November 2017, so less than a year, um, 10 months, the approval of Putin dropped by 20%. So he lost one fifth of his, uh, essentially, of his uh, support. This is unusually big uh, decline, uh, where essentially for the first time throughout his rule, we observe such a sharp dramatic uh, decline in the ratings. Um, I have mentioned that the key contributing factor, the last essentially straw, was the retirement age increase, but it's important to uh, actually underline that the small erosion that wasn't going before and actually that led to eventually this big sharp drop was the decline in real disposable incomes of Russians. So no matter what the Kremlin does, in other words, no matter how many geopolitical, so-called geopolitical uh, victories it has, and no matter how active Russian propaganda, you see there is still consistent association between Russia's well-being and approval for Putin. And that's the key. Uh, now, what does it mean in terms of attitudes towards the West and the foreign policy? Um, so if you look at the polls, Russians still uh, essentially give Putin the highest credit for his geopolitic geopolitical victories. So uh, this relationship is still there. However, and that's key, what is changing is the salience of those issues. So you see increasingly the attitudes of the Russians, their focus shifting towards the issues of the domestic economy. Most of them, increasingly large numbers of people, uh, believe that the country is not going in the right direction and that the Kremlin should be focusing on domestic policies. Uh, so this is a fundamental shift. Not so much change in attitudes towards Geopolitic, geopolitics in, towards what people believe uh, foreign policy, what, sh what the foreign policy should be focusing on, but rather the change in salience of these issues. This is less important. And this continues until now. Uh, now, the important thing th that happened this summer uh, was also, of course, the soccer championship. Russia hosted the World Cup. And that coincided with uh, actually some increase in attitudes, approval uh, uh, in attitudes towards the West. Uh, it's not a very significant uh, change, about 5% increase in attitudes towards the United States and Europe. Uh, after the end of um, uh, the uh, World Cup, this improval, improvement unfortunately has uh, stopped. But uh, actually, just today, uh, Balanovsky, one of Russia's known sociologists, released a series of another rounds of interviews, in-depth interviews that he held with Russians from different regions. He still notices uh, some uh, demand for softening of the foreign policy posture. So what Russians are saying in the focus group is that, yeah, we understand geopolitics is great. We don't think, though, this should be a priority. We think Russia's relationships with the West should be improving. Uh, and at least we shouldn't be uh, as aggressive anymore. So you see that while even that even if the improvement or the de this demand is not yet uh, reflected in the polls, you see that there's actually changing attitudes among the Russian population towards the West. And that, I would argue, is actually a direct consequence of the wo worsening of the economic situation. So there is actually um, uh, such a phenomenon in the post-imperial syndrome is that you are very, essentially, um, you're more aggressive uh, when uh, you're doing well economically. But when economic, economic situation is not doing as well, you may as well reconsider your relationship with the West. And this, this is what seems to be happening on the polling level. Now, where does it leave the Kremlin? So as you see, the Kremlin is not longer able to, to essentially ensure its legitimacy through improvement of the 
economical being of the Russians. And this is not going to be happening anytime soon because of the way Russia's economy is structured, because of the tensions with the West and the existing sanctions. So that is essentially uh, a no-go. Uh, another thing is that now that the Kremlin's legitimacy was based upon geopolitics, kind of going back to the economy is a sign of weakness too, right? That means that you are not as great anymore, not as hawkish, and you have to go back to the old ways, essentially, uh, rearranging itself. So that's another constraint. At the same time, there is no so much, it's not as many opportunities to achieve an electoral boost through geopolitical victories either. Uh, there is a huge, essentially, tiredness uh, um, in, in the population from the constant intense propaganda, from this const constant feeling of the mobilization that the media imposes on the population. And that is actually, uh, not something Russians think the Kremlin should be doing at the moment. So, as you can see, uh, in terms of the 2024, the 2024 uh, issue, the next uh, presidential election, the Kremlin's facing a big uh, dilemma where, the tr again, the both sources of support that um, it was relying upon are no longer essentially available to it. So at this moment, we see there's different uh, essential options being discussed, one of them being uh, Belarus, potentially restructuring uh, Russia and Belarus, um, essentially a political framework, so that Putin becomes the head of this uh, system, or um, essentially maybe perhaps even improving relationships with the West. There is a little, at least some subtle attempts uh, to do that uh, with um, the West. But fundamentally, the issue is, as of now, is not really resolved for the Kremlin. Thank you. Uh, Ivan, I'd like to come back to you. Um, you mentioned um, one of the most interesting actors in Russia today, um, Alexander Navalny. Uh, you spoke about his role, in, in a sense, informing the Russian people about the problems, especially of corruption. Uh, in, in the Kremlin. Uh, but you also noted that the protests we've seen about pensions seem to be I mean, spontaneous. So my, my question for you is, is, is this. Is no Navalny simply a purveyor of information or is he a political actor who has a future as a political actor? That's not Yes. Ну, исходя из того, как я оцениваю общую политическую конфигурацию, конечно, есть политический субъект вообще в политическом российском пространстве. Это один Владимир Путин, потому что у нас установлена персоналистская диктатура. Uh, the way I evaluate the political situation in Russia that we have only one uh, political uh, subject is uh, Vladimir Putin, because we have a personalist, uh, personal dictatorship. Uh, если говорить об Алексее Навальном, то, безусловно, это uh, самая влиятельная оппозиционная фигура. У него, безусловно, есть своя политическая субъектность, вот как оппозиционера. So, when it comes to Mr. Navalny, he is uh, definitely an, an important opposition figure. And he, has, uh, he is also a political actor within uh, the opposition. Uh, но, на мой взгляд, любые разговоры про будущую политическую конфигурацию и uh, роль uh, тех или иных людей вот в этой будущей постпунтской России, они несколько умозрительны. But in my view, any discussion about future political configuration and any role actors will play in a post-Putin Russia are a little bit of uh, conjecture. Мы не знаем сроков падения режима и не знаем характера падения режима. We don't know uh, the terms uh, for the regime fall, we don't know when the regime will fall, and we don't know how it will fall. Как правило, вот такие жестко авторитарные режимы диктатуры, они бывают обрушиваются внезапно. So usually those inflexible authoritarian regimes uh, fall suddenly. Ну и, соответственно, политическая конфигурация и как бы весь расклад, который после этого происходит, он меняется стремительно, буквально в несколько месяцев. So, and then usually political configuration um, keeps changing very fast, and it usually takes within a matter of months. Даже если мы вспомним uh, события декабря 2011 -го года, uh, очень быстро там, появились и какую-то политическую субъектность, uh, получили фигуры, которые как бы даже себя как политики не позиционировали. So if we remember the events of uh, 2011, 
then uh, we see, saw the emergence of uh, political uh, figures that were not even positioning themselves as uh, political actors. Ну, и вообще, если говорить как бы про там, позиционирование Навального в будущем, на мой взгляд, там, российской оппозиции важно отвечать не кто вместо Путина, а что вместо Путина. Uh, сейчас uh, в России разрушены все институты, институт масс-медиа, свободного СМИ, институт суда, институт выборов, все институты разрушены. So all the institutions are destroyed uh, in Russia, free media institution is destroyed, the independent judiciary is destroyed. Соответственно, нам в будущем, там, в постпутинской России предстоит в некотором смысле переучреждение государства, нужно заново выстраивать эти институты. So in the post-Putin Russia we will have to we have experienced the secondary birth of the of the government we have to resurrect these institutions вот ну и безусловно я надеюсь что как бы там навальный его сторонники и другие представители российской оппозиции которые сейчас в россии или сейчас находятся вынуждены за рубежом они в этом направлении будут работать so i think that uh, i hope that navalny and his supporters and other representatives of uh, the russian opposition including those that are currently are abroad will be working uh, in uh, this direction. Your, your points are well taken. Uh, the, the Kremlin has been very, um, I would say, careful with Navalny. Uh, on the one hand, we, we see efforts to you know, uh, prevent him from running for office. Uh, we recently saw efforts to keep him from leaving the country, but now they seem to have backed off that. How do you interpret the fact they first they put up a little bit of an obstacle, then they remove it? What, what does this mean? Это, наверное, один из самых дискуссионных вопросов в российской оппозиции. I think this is one of the most issues uh, that are most discussed, subjected, most discussed, or most uh, open to discussion. На мой взгляд, Кремль при при том, что у нас персоналистская диктатура в России, uh, там есть разные центры силы все-таки. Maybe because uh, Kremlin, while it is a personal dictatorship or personalist uh, dictatorship, it does have uh, several uh, forces uh, within it. И uh, они используют разные механизмы uh, как бы политической борьбы. И я допускаю, это невозможно утверждать, что uh, известные блогеры, в том числе там, Алексей Навальный, может им восприниматься как фактор внутриполитической борьбы. So they use various mechanisms of uh, political, uh, political maybe fighting or infighting, and so then uh, Mr. Navalny, uh, being a blogger, then is used uh, for their uh, internal power struggles. Ну, можно привести такой пример, как бы отдаленный. Это пример с руководителем РЖД и Куниным. For example, I can bring an example, but maybe not too close of an example, is uh, with the head of the Russian Railway Corporation, Mr. Kunin. Колоссальная госкорпорация, которая перед чемпионатом мира по футболу имела uh, контрактов на 30 миллиардов долларов. A enormous uh, state uh, corporation that uh, had, uh, right before the soccer championship, had an amount of contracts worth of 30 billion dollars. И это очень вкусный пирог, понятно, что. And this, this pie is quite tasty, and it's obvious. Uh, но uh, Икунин это человек uh, как бы из личного окружения Путина, и uh, сложно представить, что начать прямую атаку против Икунина как бы в этой ситуации. So, but Ukunin is a person that belongs to the inner circle of, uh, of Putin, and so uh, it's very hard to imagine uh, to, that anybody would uh, take a direct attack on Mr. Ikunin. Ну, и мы увидели в определенный момент, что началось как бы давление по разным фронтам на Икунина, как бы рассказы про шубохранилище. То есть это не только Навальный, это была целая как бы группа людей, которые как бы фиксировали. And then we see uh, certain attacks uh, happening on various fronts. For example, when they talk about the storage uh, for the fur coats uh, at uh, Mr. Ikunin and so on and so forth. So we see not one, you know, uh, attack, we'll say, for example, by Mr. Navalny, but uh, this coming from uh, various uh, sources or various angles. And for the opposition, it's not a problem to remove the corruption of the corruption. 
So for those who belong to the opposition, it's not a problem to uh, to reveal another corruptioner. Ну, но в результате мы увидели смещение, э, значит, и Кунина и передачу этой корпорации вместе с этими контрактами в какие-то другие руки. But the result of this, we saw that Mr. Ikunin was uh, actually dismissed uh, from his position, and the corporation was handed uh, to another person or to another group of persons. Это одна из опций, почему, допустим, большие блогеры, они могут, э, им может позволяться работать. So this could be one of the options or reasons why major bloggers are allowed to function. Но при этом, э, мне кажется, общий тренд, э, как бы, путинской диктатуры такой, что какие бы ни были при, э, в, в прошлом э, установки, схемы и мировосприятия, она все время меняется, и меняется в сторону, как бы, ужесточения. But uh, I think that the common trend within uh, Putin's dictatorship is uh, is it's ever changing, and its approach is changing, and uh, there is tweaking happening. But the common trend that it becomes uh, more and more strict. И в этой ситуации, в этой ситуации, на мой взгляд, жесткие меры в отношении ФБК, там закрытие его и персональные проблемы серьезно Алексея это дело времени. So uh, then I think that uh, the problems of uh, FBK, uh, which, is, uh, FBK Navalny, uh, uh, which is the organization of Mr. Navalny and Mr. Navalny himself, uh, this is a matter of time before the crackdown will occur. Картина становится черно-белой. So the, the picture becomes more and more black and white. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Moscow is distance itself is not now enforcing decisions by the human rights court in Europe. Uh, you've been active, of course, not just as a defense attorney in Russia, but you've also been talking about your cases abroad. Uh, what's, what impact, if any, has the Kremlin decision to ignore human rights court decisions had on its reputation in Europe, especially in Germany. Mm -hmm. I think it's safe to say if, if, if for some reason um, the United States were to run a thwart of the Human Rights Court, there'd be great criticism of us coming from European capitals. Could you repeat that? If, if, if the United States is perceived as violating human rights, there'd be there's great criticism coming from other capitals, especially in Europe. Дело в том, что решения Европейского суда по правам человека имеют, так сказать, как процессуальную, так и материальную часть. Вот компенсации, так называемые, которые принимает своим решением суд, Европейский суд, относительно жалоб из России, Российская Федерация более или менее исполняет. Да, так сказать, отказавшись исполнять, только э, было такое дело миноритарных акционеров ЮКОСа, вот по ним было принято специальное решение, эти 2 миллиарда, которые присудил СПЧ, они отказались исполнять, используя вот эту норму о конституционном суде, который вправе э, значит, принять решение о неисполнении решения э, э, СПЧ в связи с тем, что оно противоречит основному закону Конституции. So um, decisions by the European courts of human rights uh, could be uh, uh, of uh, two types. There could be the ones related to the procedure and the ones uh, that set the amount of uh, financial compensation. When it comes to uh, European Court of Human Rights decisions uh, related to financial compensation, there these decisions are more or less followed in Russia, with the exception of uh, Yuko's case, when uh, there was a decision to award Two million dollars. Okay, uh, when there was a decision to award uh, two billion dollars um, to minority holders uh, in uh, of, of Yukos shareholders, and this decision was not followed because the uh, the Russian uh, court uh, decided that it is an, it is not in line with the Russian constitution. So this decision was not followed. Но процессуальную часть решений процентов 80 Россия не исполняет. И, например, Алексей Навального, хорошо известен, 
По первому делу Киров Леса, его обвиняли, так сказать, в уголовном преступлении. ЕСПЧ отменил приговор суда в Кирове, который вынес обвинительный акт в отношении Алексея Навального, приговорив его к пяти годам лишения свободы. Но после обжалования и получения Навальным решения суда, отменяющего первый вердикт, первый, ну, первое решение, Значит, повторно принял то же самое решение, чуть изменив основание, понимаете? So, but when it comes to uh, decisions of the European Court and Human Rights related to procedures, 80% of uh, these decisions are not followed. For example, uh, Mr. Navalny case related to Kirov Lias, he was uh, sentenced there to he was um, he was sentenced there to five years of prison, and uh, this uh, decision was. Uh, Um, invalidated or vacated by by the European Courts and Human Rights. So what uh, Kirov or local court in Russia did was uh, to invalidate the previous decision, but then uh, then uh, reinstated the decision with the same sentence, uh, just uh, changing the the foundation for the for the decision. Поэтому uh, роль европейского суда она не полная. В том смысле, что жалобы, которые подаются российскими гражданами, а я напомню, что э, российская, э, российские жалобы занимают первое место по количеству обращений в Европейский суд правам человека, в общем-то, Европейский суд правам человека не может исправить ситуацию. Не может исправить ситуацию с правосудием в России и с э, защитой прав, э, прав э, граждан России. So uh, the role of, uh, of the European Courts of Human Rights on the situation is limited. So while Russian, citizen, uh, Russian complaints are um, actually is, is at the first place among uh, all the complaints that are received by the European Courts on Human Rights, uh, th this cannot uh, change the situation with the justice in Russia and uh, with the protection of uh, Russian citizens' rights. И, к сожалению, для европейских столиц и для Берлина этот вопрос все-таки не приоритетный. Совсем не приоритетный. Unfortunately, for the European capitals and for Berlin, uh, this issue is not a priority, not a priority at all. Они понимают, что нет рычагов заставить uh, следовать нормам международного права и исполнять решения международных институций по обязательствам, которые Россия на себя приняла. И поэтому они никаких особых усилий в этом направлении не предпринимают. And so, unfortunately, they see that there is no leverage to force Russia to follow um, the, uh, the, the agreements that Russia has signed and the duties that Russia took upon itself uh, when it comes to justice. So, they don't uh, work uh, in uh, this direction. Ну вот, например, еще один я вам пример приведу. Вы знаете, что Украина подала в отношении России свой иск в Международном суде ООН в Гаге. So uh, one more example, Ukraine uh, actually um, supplied a motion to the court in the, in the Hague, uh, the UN court. И, собственно говоря, там касается двух вещей, Донбасса и Крыма, это обращение. So, and this uh, motion or appeal to the court in Hague has to do with uh, two, um, two issues. One is the issue of Donbass and the second uh, is about the Crimea. Международный суд ООН, юрисдикцию которого пока еще Россия признает, принял решение об обеспечительных мерах, о том, что в Крыму до момента, пока не будет вынесено окончательное решение по иску Украины, например, должны быть возобновить свое действие организации крымских татар, в частности Меджлис, что Россия, которая запретила его деятельность на территории Российской Федерации, ну и, соответственно, Крыма, должна разрешить снова эту деятельность этой организации снова ее зарегистрировать, снять запрет на ее деятельность. Ну, ответ очевиден, Россия этого не сделала. Хотя это обязывающее решение, Россия этого не сделала. Это показатель того, что какие бы решения не принимались в судах универсальной юстиции, Россия к этому относится абсолютно безразлично. So, uh, the, when it comes to one more example related to the International UN Court, Russia still recognizes uh, the International UN Court. And uh, this, uh, this court uh, actually passed a decision related to the Crimea and uh, to Mejlis, the organization uh, of uh, Tatars. 
and this uh, international UN court uh, passed a decision that is a mandatory decision to uh, that uh, the Tatar, this Tatar organization should be allowed uh, to function. It should be allowed to be registered. Um, and uh, this organization is uh, currently banned in Russia and therefore is banned in Crimea. But what did Russia do in response to the mandatory decision of the UN court? It uh, simply ignored it. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, an example of uh, how uh, of Russia's attitude towards uh, the institutions of universal justice. Поэтому я считаю, что Европа uh, совершенно безразлично относится к этой ситуации, понимая, что сделать ничего не может. So therefore, I think that the Europe uh, kind of uh, shows an uncaring approach towards the situation, understanding that it cannot uh, do anything about it. Okay, thank you. Um, Maria, you, you spoke about Again, the use of foreign policy is a legitimizing factor for Mr. Putin. Um, and you talked about his possible next steps. And you offered a wide range of possibilities from a, an Anschluss, presumably with Belarus on the hardline side, to improving ties with the West. If you could talk a bit more about each of those possibilities and how that might play for him. Uh, so, uh, as we know, the 2024 problem uh, represents a challenge for the Kremlin at the moment because according to the uh, Constitution, uh, the president, the current person cannot stay in power for two consecutive terms. So there would have to be some modification to be uh, to occur for Putin to remain in power. It's also pretty uh, obvious that Putin is not going anywhere, that over these years he's concentrated all the support and so much love and so much hate at the same time that it's just really impossible for him to uh, leave. Um, the elites, of course, the, the balance of the elites also depends uh, on his presence in power uh, and a lot of other factors. Um, now, what is the Kremlin to do in this situation? So we, of course, it's important to uh, underline that we are just at the beginning of this uh, essentially difficult dilemma being faced uh, by the Kremlin. They just won another presidential election quite successfully, and they have six years, a little bit less than six years ahead of them. Um, now, as I mentioned, an important challenge that the Kremlin is facing is the overall stagnation in the economy. Um, the political system, to a large extent, is built upon the so-called rent redistribution, the uh, important, like, uh, profitable sectors of uh, half half-nationalized profitable sectors of Russian economy generate revenues that are later redis redistributed to different levels of the um, elites and population to ensure support. Uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, contributing to a lot of corruption, but this scheme is not reformable for this current regime because this is where the foundation of Putin's base um, um, is um, essentially grounded. Now, uh, what is the, so the reforms, the economic reforms are not an issue. So what is the Kremlin to do in this situation? Now, of course, sanctions are one annoying factor. I would point out that the sanctions effect is kind of uh, conditional on the oil prices. When the oil prices are high, uh, for example, as in the last months, sanctions are less biting. But when the oil prices are declining, this is where the lack of foreign investment and the sanction imposed risks begin to fail. This is why the Kremlin is quite unhappy uh, with the sanctions and this is why they are actually trying to take some steps to eliminate them, even if they're not very open about those sanctions. And by the way, this is also a big reason why the West should re remain uh, very decisive uh, in its posture and actually keep introducing those sanctions on the Kremlin. Uh, now this actually uh, suggests that in the next, uh, one of the next steps may be improving relationships with the West. Uh, we see that, for example, in the last midterms, the interference was mm, not very significant. Uh, so the Kremlin probably has learned some lesson. Uh, we, by the way, observed the same dynamic uh, in Latvia, which also had the election in October, and this still was not much of the Kremlin interference. They're actually trying off different approaches, one of them being a softer uh, posture, being a little bit softer uh, with the West. 
In the long term, however, it is clear that the Kremlin's interests are quite opposite to those of the West, so it's not, it doesn't look like a very viable option from a long term perspective. Now, an alternative possibility would be, as I have mentioned, to create another kind of idea of the geopolitical victory in the minds of Russians. Even if, as again I have mentioned before, that is not something most Russians actually want. Uh, again, the polls consistently show the fatigue of the foreign policy agenda and the, of the constant mobilization of the um, public mood uh, based on these military victories. No. One important uh, consideration is Syria, which actually did not really uh, lead to fundamental change in, uh, pro in the Kremlin uh, polls. So Syria, that most, uh, most Russians think of Syria as something distant and not very relevant to them. And it didn't, for example, have a similar impact as Crimea annexation had on uh, the approval of Putin and the Kremlin ratings as well. The idea with Belarus is to actually uh, try to reinforce the existing structures of the uh, United, uh, United States. So as you know, the, uh, Belarus and Russia at the moment have this common uh, United uh, State, so-called. And the idea is actually to reinforce these processes, the integration, perhaps kind of rebuilding Russia's uh, political structure so that Putin now becomes the head of both Belarus and the Russian states. Um, Belarus is certainly quite aware of this uh, discussion ongoing in the Kremlin. In fact, most Belarusian experts I spoke to, they consistently point out that they do notice um, increase, an increased interest of the Kremlin in Belarus. Um, and particularly uh, interesting in these regards is the um, attitudes of Lukashenko, the Belarusian uh, president, towards it. He's becoming increasingly cautious about Moscow, actually is trying desperately to improve relationships either with the West or with China as a kind of an attempt to counterbalance uh, the Kremlin influences in Belarus. There is also very consistent ongoing attempts by the Russian state to kind of get rid of the, of the so-called Kremlin's fifth column in, the, in Belarus. For example, there are ongoing processes against the pro-Kremlin priests. There are attempts to change a little bit the political um, uh, elites and replace those that are too loyal to the Kremlin or with the less loyal ones. There are uh, attempts to essentially reinforce the military and security apparatus. Um, and of course, uh, once again, a very important factor is that Lukashenko actively develops connections with China, hoping that that will be one of the ways to essentially uh, limit the uh, Moscow penetration into the country. Uh, it is also clear that Belarus is going to be a much tougher case for the Kremlin uh, than Ukraine used to be. One of the reasons is somewhat ironically uh, because Belarus is a dictatorship and has much stronger military and security apparatus. The other reason is that because Lukashenko is really aware of the Kremlin's interest in Belarus. And so he will try his best to essentially keep himself in power. It is very clear, by the way, uh, his concerns are based on the fact that if the Kremlin essentially goes into Belarus, of course, uh, Lukashenko will have to go. Something will have to happen and he will not be as powerful as he is at the moment. Uh, now, other options uh, th that are being actually discussed, um, uh, other countries from the post-Soviet space, right? Remember, there's Armenia, there, uh, that's quite uh, interesting changes going there that the Kremlin is definitely concerned about. There is always uh, still other countries such as Kazakhstan uh, and the northern uh, Kazakhstan problem uh, that is also always there. So there are, there are all kinds of possibilities. The big question is, can you really sell it to Russians at this point? I mean, over the last years we've seen that anything, honestly, can be sold to Russians. But is it going to help the Kremlin to achieve the desired effect? That is, limit the sources of political and economic instability, right? To ensure consistent high levels of approval. That's the big dilemma. And the last point I wanted to make is I actually disagree a little bit uh, with Ivan in his point, uh, with his point about um, dictatorships of Putin's style suddenly collapsing. I don't think they collapse suddenly, at least uh, based on the available political science literature. Uh, sorry, I have to bring up my PhD background. Uh, 
uh, we see that lost the kind of neopatrimonial systems of Putin type, the personalistic <coughs> systems of Putin type, they actually erode over time. And the erosion is to a large extent based on the economic stagnation that, that is ongoing over the years, <coughs> where you see increasing economic frustration accumulating in the population, uh, which eventually joins the political protest. So today what you observe in Russia, from my perspective, is some kind of beginning of this process, where in the um, essentially more um, regional, more provincial Russia, you see the accumulation of economic frustration. <coughs> Poor regions of Russia are definitely becoming increasingly frustrated uh, with the, thing, the way things are in the country. This has been reflected in the last regional elections in September 2018, when a lot of Kremlin's um, uh, United Russia candidates uh, were not actually, did not enjoy as high um, support. And in four regions, we even had second round of uh, governor's elections, which didn't happen in Russia for essentially for the last, uh, s since the governor's elections were introduced in 2012. It's the first time we observe this kind of uh, change. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you see accumulation of political protest in the big cities like Moscow or St. Petersburg. This is the kind of protest that is led by Navalny. The problem, with, as I see it at the moment, is that those two protests are very different in terms of their uh, values, in terms of their uh, frustrations, in terms of their demands and in terms of the political actors to whom they oriented, oriented these demands. And they cannot really join each other. So over what you observe on the example of the other personalistic systems of Putin type is that eventually, after many years, yeah, I don't want to be overly optimistic, this process is, these two protests end up joining, merging, uh, joining each other, like merging to together. And when it happens, this is where you may observe some kind of fundamental change in the system. So of course, we're nowhere near that process in Russia at the moment. But in the long term, I think this is where eventually things are headed. Thank you. OK, we've, uh, I, I must apologize for never having used the words uh, story or stagnation, which we've, we're seeing in Russia today. Yeah. But we have to turn to the questions to the audience. OK, first question right there, and then here and here. Wait, wait, the uh, microphone is coming. Yes, introduce yourself, please. Yes, yes, yes. Alek Nikulov, West TLV Media Group from Riga, Latvia. Um, uh, in uh, Latvia, as you know, 40% of the population are Russian speaking. Okay, what is the position of uh, uh, Russia's liberal democratic movements or opposition parties to uh, systematic discrimination of Russian language population in Baltic states of uh, Latvia and Estonia? Uh, for instance, in Latvia, laws have been adopted eliminating, totally eliminating Russian language education, including private schools. Uh, there is no citizenship issue. Uh, the fines and punishments of for non-sufficient usage of La Latvian language has been increased, and many other issues like that. So are you ready to stand up for universal, or for observance of universal human rights in uh, uh, Baltic states as uh, vigorously as you're standing up uh, for that same thing in Russia? Proper, thank you. Я отвечу и как писатель форума свободы на России, как человек, который в странах Балтии живет уже несколько лет. Я политически беж. One to three, Mike, Mike, son. Okay. I will respond as a as a person uh, that uh, is a member of the forum of Free Russia, but also as a person who lives uh, in uh, in the Baltics. В двенадцатом году был вынужден ехать из России, я политически беженец, я живу в Литве и год жил в Латвии перед этим. Uh, in 2012, I had to leave uh, Russia. I'm a political refugee, and so I live in Lithuania. And uh, for a year, I go to Latvia. And for a year, I have lived in Latvia. Вопрос, на который у меня нет ответа, это почему люди, которые живут уже 27 лет в независимой Латвии и Литве. So I have a question, but I don't have an answer. How come people who live for 27 years in now independent Lithuania? не удосужились выучить язык этой страны. Never, uh, uh, to С моей точки зрения, это проявление некого неуважения суверенитету, суверенитету балтийских стран. За все эти годы я и моя семья мы ни разу не столкнулись с проявлением бытового, uh, бытовой русофобии какой-то. Uh, during all these years, I, 
me, when it comes to me and my family, we have never encountered uh, a case of uh, just uh, russophobia uh, a common on the street. Да, но то, что можно утверждать, что вот это русскоговорящее население, которое находится под влиянием российской пропаганды, основных телеканалов. But uh, what could be asserted that uh, this Russian-speaking population that is under influence of uh, Russian propaganda, Russian TV channels. Они поддерживают политику Кремля, они выступают за аннексию Крыма, они поддерживают действия в Сирии. То есть 90% русскоговорящих людей это люди, которые поддерживают политику Путина и uh, пребывают под полным uh, принятием пропаганды. So, and they are supporting the annexation of Crimea, and they are supporting Russian actions in uh, Syria. And uh, I would say 90% of people, um, of Russian-speaking people there, are totally under the spell of uh, the Russian propaganda and uh, supporting uh, Kremlin policies. Yeah, uh, мы видели, что произошло в Донбассе, мы видели гибридный сценарий. We saw what happened in Donbass. We saw the hybrid scenario there. И невзирая на то, что страны Балтии являются членами НАТО и надеются на пятую статью э, устава НАТО. Even though uh, Baltic countries uh, are members of NATO and they hope uh, they believe in the fifth article of NATO. Нельзя uh, игнорировать, нельзя uh, как бы игнорировать возможность uh, как бы вторжения или попытки реализации гибридного сценария в Нарве, в Эстонии или где-нибудь в Латвии. One uh, cannot uh, ignore the, the, the opportunity for invasion or uh, the chance for the scenario of invasion in uh, Estonia or in Narva or somewhere else. В этой связи я как житель Балтийской Республики, я считаю, что идея по развитию собственного языка, собственной культуры, собственной идентичности суверенных стран Балтии Это абсолютно правильные, это абсолютно правильные тренды, правильные действия. And thus, as a resident of one of uh, the Baltic countries, I believe that uh, the the work uh, towards developing its own sovereignty, to, towards developing its own identity, is uh, is absolutely correct uh, and the right thing to do. Thank you. Okay, question over here. Uh, Alexander Naumov from George Mason University. Uh, I want to ask, how does the the Putin system and United Russia today, how do they plan to reconcile or gain legitimacy with the generation that's under 35 right now? Given that there's kind of the elephant in the room that all the politicians today, not just politicians, but the business elites, they were in the Komsomol before. And uh, the people of my generation have a completely post-Soviet mindset. So are they going to try to reconcile this? Yeah. And uh, how do you see the role of institutions of youth politics like Ros uh youth forums, uh, youth parliaments, and other things like that? Good, good question. Are you a Russian citizen? I'm a dual citizen. Both dual citizen. Okay, right, okay, thank you. Um, I can uh, try to comment on it since I published uh, a report on the Russian youth with the Center for European Policy Analysis, where I am a young fellow. Uh, I think it's a really important and interesting question, uh, and there is a lot of debate among the Russian experts uh, when it comes to the problem of the youth. What happened is that essentially, in uh, starting about 2010, when the big um, Kremlin's projects, like Ross Maladjosh, you mentioned, or Nash, essentially uh, stopped. Uh, active, ex active, active, active work in the regions. Essentially, the Kremlin lost the youth, so to say. In uh, a lot of Russian regions are not developing as fast as we have discussed uh, uh, before. A lot of them are stagnating. There's not a, as many social lifts uh, which the Putin systems is directly responsible for. This results in a lot of younger people in the regions, essentially, not knowing what's going to happen to them, right? They know that the biggest, uh, the most profitable options are occupied by, I don't know, either some Kremlin elites or their f families or their, uh, essentially, uh, offsprings. And there is not a lot of options. Plus, the contemporary youth, as it has been mentioned, is much more westernized in their uh, opinions, in their, uh, essentially, uh, preferences. Many of them watch Western TV channels. And that, by the way, uh, is the same thing we observe in Latvia as well. I just spoke to my colleagues in Latvia. They say all they say the same thing. The new younger generation, even, even among the uh, Russians in La La Russian speaking population in Latvia, they're all much more Westernized because of this access to, to the Western culture. 
And so what we see is the, yeah, at the same time, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, the narrative of the Kremlin and Putin himself definitely is increasingly at odds with the language in, uh, that this younger population uses. Uh, they just don't speak the same language. They are much older, essentially, uh, Putin is perceived as a grandpa. And the interesting thing is that um, Kremlin knows it. So Navalny uh, is, one, is one of the politicians who's noticed this demand coming from the younger generation and very actively used it, politicized it. These are among the younger Russians are among his biggest supporters. If you go to the protests, particularly those that are not allowed by the authorities, you see uh, disproportionately high representation of the Russian, uh, Russian youth. If you look, if you watch Navalny's channel, you see it actually uses a lot of this language and approaches the younger uh, Russians use. The Kremlin noticed that, and originally, during the presidential campaign, Putin actually tried approaching the Russian youth. And they, there were several like big meetings organized with the Russian молодежь, with the Russian youth, with the president. And the interesting thing is that, is that actually it resulted in a complete failure. So he just didn't know how to communicate with them. You can, it's available online because you can see it. Essentially, he makes this kind of vulgar type of jokes that he's particularly notorious for. And there is zero response from the uh, younger people. They are looking at him as he's some kind of old crazy. You know, he's saying something vulgar and that is not funny, that's not cool. He's not there with them. So essentially, just to sum it up, the uh, essentially increasing discrepancy between these younger Russians and the current political system is the result of two things. First of all, the elites are getting older, like Brezhnev style, Zastoy, I'm going to use this word finally, uh, where uh, the elites are increasingly at odds, particularly with the, with the younger uh, generation groups. At the same time, uh, the uh, stagnation in the regions, the lack of social lifts, lack of, econ lack of economic prospects also leads to increasing frustration, particularly among the younger uh, Russians that are not built in the current uh, system of the political support. So what is the Kremlin to do in this situation? Uh, we've seen several attempts after the Kremlin realized uh, the failure with the youth, several attempts to maybe restart the big projects of the Nazi style in the region. Uh, it's unlikely this is going to happen because there's just not enough money uh, for that in the current political system. And also, frankly, uh, not a lot of um, um, kind of, uh, not as many professional, uh, even people, essentially political experts to deal with this problem at that level. So it is very likely that the Kremlin will not be able to resolve this problem and that the accumulation of the frustration at the, uh, among the younger generation will keep increasing. It's also true that, unfortunately, the preferences tend to change as you mature. So it's possible that as they grow up, as they essentially find their way to essentially become part of the system that's built in Russia, it's possible that some of them will become more loyal. But um, odds are that a lot of them will remain quite frustrated and unhappy with the way things are. Like, I can tell you that this new generation is different from the way things were with my generation. They are much more protest-minded than mine used to be. Essentially, it's cool to be in the protest these days among the younger Russians, unlike what things used to be uh, when I was growing up. So it is likely that in 10 years, uh, when this uh, generation grows up, we will observe an increasing uh, protest-minded uh, group, particularly among these younger Russians. Thank you. Question here? And there and here. Um, thank you so much for an interesting discussion. My name is Valeria Yegisman, Voice of America Russian Service. So my, uh, I would like to go back to sanctions and if possible to get the view of all the panelists on do you think that sanctions work? What is their effect on uh, economy, population and uh, most of all on the political elite? And then I would like to ask specifically uh, Mark and Ivan about your initiative on the Putin's list that you have just uh, presented here in Washington, D.C. to different U.S. officials. Okay, well, no, we, we, because the time is limited, mm -hmm. they can answer those specific questions and then um, Maria and I will talk about sanctions. Thank you. Okay, all right. Can you again rephrase the question? Start with the non-sanctions question. My second part of my question. The second please. question, yes. Uh, so, uh, Forum of Free Russia has just presented uh, the list of people who they think uh, should be sanctioned by the United States here in Washington, D.C. You've met with different uh, U.S. officials. So, I would like to get your uh, opinion on 
what do you think the reaction of the U.S. officials was, what this list is about, like just to expand a little bit on this. Thank you. Дело в том, что список Путина – это, прежде всего, документ декларации, принятый Форумом Свободной России. Там собраны в перечень, в этом перечне из двух с лишним сот фамилий люди, которых мы считаем ответственными за уничтожение демократии, за коррупцию, за нарушение прав человека. So uh, this uh, Putin's list is a declaration prepared by the Forum Free Russia. It, uh, it, is a, it comprises 200 uh, individuals, 200 last names of people that are respon responsible for the destruction of democracy, destruction of human rights. Да, и пропаганду. Это тоже очень важно. And propaganda. This is very important to mention. Uh, дело в том, что документ был принят еще год назад, в семнадцатом году, в декабре, на одном из форумов Свободной России. This uh, document was adopted uh, at one of the forums of uh, Free Russia in December 2017. Тогда же он был обнародован. That's when it was uh, publicized. Uh, так что, в общем, он секретом для uh, заинтересованных сторон различных и в США, и в Европе секретом не являлся. So it was not a secret uh, for the stakeholders both in the United States and in Russia. Дело в том, что многие из фигурантов этого документа уже, так сказать, находятся под санкциями американскими и европейскими. The thing is, uh, many of the individuals on this list are already under uh, U.S. and European sanctions. И в этом смысле, конечно, мы не ставили себе задачей полный исчерпывающий перечень этих фамилий подвести под санкции или другие рестрикции конкретно вот в эти сроки, когда мы находились в Вашингтоне с визитом и встречались с различными ведомствами, прежде всего в Конгрессе, в Сенате, в Палате представителей. Мы не рассчитывали, что все 200 там, человек окажутся в каких-то санкционно списка в ближайшее время. So in that sense we weren't counting that uh, everybody on this list uh, would be placed under sanctions. And so that was not the goal of our uh, meetings uh, in Congress uh, with uh, meetings in Senate and uh, with the representatives from the House of Representatives. Uh, we did not expect that all of them will get on the list. Наша главная задача это информация и политический обмен. Our uh, main goal was uh, disseminating the information and uh, political exchange. Uh, и, например, в комитете по международным делам Сената и палат представителей, так сказать, uh, мы даже в большей степени получали информацию о том, как обстоят дела с uh, законопроектом, который предполагается обсуждать теперь уже в новом составе Конгресса. И это даже для нас было чуть важнее, поскольку мы Uh, будем следить за ситуацией, когда будут эти новые акты приниматься, вступать в действие тоже. Поскольку фамилии – это второй этап, это не первый этап. Фамилии – это уже uh, конкретных лиц, персоналей, uh, вопрос uh, непосредственно исполнительных органов власти, которые будут uh, исполнять uh, в том случае, если законопроект будет принят, скажем, в январе или феврале. So when it comes to our meetings, uh, for example, uh, the U.S. Senate Committee on International Affairs and the corresponding committee in the House of Representatives was not so, mu uh, was not so much on uh, propagating this list as uh, learning about the relevant law, draft law, that, that is being worked on there. Because uh, including choosing uh, certain last names is the second stage uh, in this process. Number one is... Uh, drafting and passing the relevant law and then the executive branch will be responsible for uh, implementing this law and this might happen in uh, in, uh, in uh, maybe in January or February next year. Но то, что можно уже сделать сейчас со списком Путина, если это сочтут для себя необходимым заинтересованные ведомства и лица, политические лица, значит, неважно, в США или в Европе, это ограничения визовые, например, которые, так сказать, могли бы применяться уже на данном этапе. Для этого не нужно совершенно ждать принятия каких-то законодательных актов. Это не совсем санкции, но это важный инструмент, с одной стороны, обеспечения защиты 
западных стран и от пропаганды, и от возможных агрессивных действий со стороны кремлевского руководства, но и в том числе, так сказать, сигнал всем этим лицам, которые перечислены в этом списке Путина и еще будут туда добавлены, безусловно, что э, их действия выходят за рамки не только цивилизованных, но и правил в смысле международного права. И, и если эти действия не прекратятся, то, конечно, следующим шагом будет и их имплементация там, на уровне уже каких-то санкционных решений, которые примет уже Конгресс или, допустим, парламенты в Европе и так далее. So, uh, what could be done with the Putin list now is, uh, for example, implementing visa restrictions uh, on the uh, people placed on the Putin's list. And then um, this could be done by the US and uh, by the European states. And there is no need to wait uh, for passing of relevant legislative acts for that. Mm -hmm. Simply, uh, this could be done to protect, uh, to protect uh, Europe and the United States uh, from propaganda, and this could uh, send a message uh, to others on this list uh, to send a signal to them that it's not okay to violate uh, international law, and the next step would be having uh, full-fledged uh, sanctions uh, with regard to those individuals. Я думаю, что Марк в целом отразил позицию форума, поэтому я не думаю, что есть смысл что-то добавлять. And I think that Mark uh, reflected uh, on the position of the forum as a whole, so I don't think it's worthy to add anything to his comment. Okay. Maybe on sanctions. I'll try to be uh, uh, quick. So there are three types of sanctions essentially being in place. Sectoral, like roughly divided into sectoral, uh, individual, and sanctions on their energy. So the, the ones that are most um, effective seem to be the individual and the um, uh, sectoral ones. Uh, so the energy all sanctions, the certain like energy restrictions will only impact uh, in the long term. Uh, the individual uh, sanctions are certainly annoying to the Kremlin, starting with the Magnitsky list. We know how essentially brutal the Kremlin has been against people who helped uh, push it forward. Uh, the sectoral ones, however, are the ones that seem to impact mostly the economy of Russia. That is, it, from my perspective, in the long term, will be the most damaging to uh, the regime. Uh, the sectoral ones include, for example, the ban on the long-term credits uh, to the Russian companies, uh, or, for example, an attempt uh, to essentially um, uh, is the last round of sanctions in, imposed in April on Deripaska's companies. Uh, the problem with most of them is that they seem to erode over, over time. So, for example, the, um, the long-term ban on credits is de, de facto was uh, lifted in September 2016. Uh, also, Russia uh, learned how to uh, essentially avoid them over time. So that means that for the West to maintain the same degree of pressure, the sanctions needs to be reintroduced and reinforced all the time. Uh, at the same time, I would uh, also highlight that there is not a lot, enough um, clarity, even uh, in the West, about the types of sanctions that are already being introduced, the ones that are planned to be. There is not even a single database where you, you can essentially see who is sanctioned, who is not. So that is something for uh, the Western countries to work on, and essentially to perhaps to a little bit formalize this process where there is more strict uh, regulations imposed. But overall, the, the sanctions are definitely uh, contributing to lower development of Russia's GDP, according to different estimates, it costs from 1 to 2 percent of GDP growth per, per year. And of course, uh, the biggest uh, problem for the Kremlin is the lack of long-term foreign investment in the economy. That is, again, the direct result of the sanctions. There is just too much uncertainty for the long-term investors to come into the economy. That means that the country cannot develop. Uh, however, I would once again highlight that there needs to be more pressure uh, to be imposed on Russia, and certainly the West should keep uh, maintain the pressure and perhaps improve, increase uh, the sanctions uh, leverage. Um, I, I agree completely with what Maria just said. I would just add that one, one, the Kremlin is very concerned about these sanctions. The Russian elite is very concerned about these sanctions, which is why there was a panic in April when our last sanctions list came out. It's clear that the mm -hmm. U.S. government, particularly driven by Congress, is going to be introducing sanctions from time to time in the future. Kurt Volker said the same thing. Mm -hmm. And this is an essential part of pressure on, on the Kremlin and on, Kremlin, on Russian economy. 
And as long as Moscow is pursuing an aggressive foreign policy, it is very much in the interest of the United States and Europe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're already over time. I'll take three questions, quick questions, 30 seconds each, starting right there. In the Alexander Kristenko, Russian TV. Uh, you constantly blame media at this uh, meeting. Um, you said like, many times about it. Uh, and I know one leader of the free world. Uh, who 15 likes seconds, to, please. Who likes to do the same. So my question is, so 20 years ago, 77% of Russians uh, uh, considered that uh, Crimea should be part of Russia. Uh, it was a time where no Putin in power, all liberals everywhere. So do you think that these uh, millions, the 10 millions of uh, Russian citizens, their names should be put in your sanction list. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank Next you. question, right here. And then here. Hi, uh, I'm Sebastian from Germany. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about how uh, the Putin regime is crumbling. And uh, in Western Europe, we actually, I, I perceive There's been that. no talk about that. Sorry? There's been no talk I, about that. There's been like some not talk here. about how it might be starting to demise. Well, uh, starting, that's, that's far from crumbling. <laughs> okay. So what's the question? Um, I actually think that in, in the Visegrad countries and also in Germany with the AFD and the Russian diaspora, uh, there's a lot of uh, adoration for Putin. And I was wondering uh, how you perceive that, whether that might actually prop up the regime in terms of foreign policy. Okay, not. thank you. Last question over here. No, the question's here. That's it. Right, this lady right here. Hi, Claire Ginner from Switzerland. My question is, how dependent is Putin on popular approval as opposed to approval of the elite? Okay, I will, I will answer the first question for on, on Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no question that a majority of Russians think that Crimea belongs to Russia. The question is, what about a majority of Crimeans? The last honest polls taken on in Crimea were taken by various Ukrainian uh, news organizations in January of 2014. Those showed that at most, there were two or three, at most 42% of the population of Crimea thought that Crimea should either be independent or part of Russia. Over 50% thought that Crimea should remain part of Ukraine. That's the relevant data. Now, second question. Uh, uh, from Germany. Yeah, all right, Re regarding, okay, if you want to take that. No, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, why don't you take the third question on the the third question over here regarding um, whether it's elites or the people of Russia. And then we'll take the question from, um, from Germany. I'll let you, I'll let you do that one. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, let me take the question okay. regarding the elites. Дело в том, что поддержка обычных обывателей на самом деле это совершенно не играющий роли элемент политики Кремля. Они не обращают внимания, есть эта поддержка нет. Они ее сами формируют в одностороннем порядке. И, так сказать, точных данных социологических о том, насколько поддерживается режим, их просто нет. Потому что любые социологические опросы дают искаженную картину. Всякий социологический опрос и всякий представитель социологической службы воспринимается как агент спецслужбы, подбегает и спрашивает, любишь ты Путина или нет. Страх это один из элементов, который искажает эту картину, поэтому говорить о обывателях, о населении, о том, как оно относится к Путину, не приходится с той же точностью. Что касается элит, конечно, они э, имеют сдавленное недовольство, но оно связано не столько с личностью Путина, сколько с реакцией на его политику, которая приводит к санкциям, а страдают именно они из-за этого. When it comes to the uh, support uh, by common people, support for the regime, the, this, is a, this is irrelevant uh, for, for, for the Kremlin. The, the Kremlin itself uh, forms uh, the, the support among, among regular people and they do it, they do, it's not a two-way street. Then also there is no exact data on the level of support uh, uh, by, by regular people of the of, of Putin's uh, of the Putin's regime, the sociological surveys that are done present distorted picture. The reason is that any um, uh, any agent of uh, any employee of the survey company is uh, it's anybody who runs up with a with a with a question, "Are you supporting you know the Putin?" is perceived as the agent of uh, special services. So, so the the information is distorted. So that's when it comes to common people. When it comes to the elites. 
they uh, they have um, unhappiness that uh, not that they don't manifest openly, uh, and that happiness has to do with uh, sanctions uh, that are placed uh, that are in place, and thus uh, they they feel the impact of these sanctions. And ну и коротко по поводу Германии, я считаю, что причина ситуации в Германии схожие, они в общем общие для всего русскоговорящего населения в странах Европы. And when it comes to Germany, the reasons uh, of the attitudes among Russian-speaking population of Germany is the same uh, for uh, the same reasons uh, for the whole uh, Russian-speaking population of other European countries. Одна из них заключается в том, что люди находятся в информационном российском пространстве. One of them is uh, that these people uh, belong to the Russian information space. Они являются объектом этой пропаганды, и они видят из России искаженную картинку. They are the objects of uh, this propaganda and they see distorted picture from Russia. В России человек uh, может услышать по первому или каналу Россия про великие достижения Путина и власти, а потом выходит на улицу, видит цены в магазине, uh, видит, как обстоят дела там. So in Russia you can uh, watch uh, первый канал, uh, channel one, or one can watch uh, Russia TV channel and then uh, and learn about great achievements by Putin, but then step into the street and see what's happening when, when with the store prices, uh, while uh, a person uh, being abroad would not see that. Ну и, конечно, не надо учитывать фактор как бы работы с российской диаспорой внутри. And also the factor of uh, working with the Russian diaspora outside of Russia should not be discounted. Да, вот совершенно очевидно, что в Германии Кремлем ведется работа по поддержке определенных вот этих правых сил. It's uh, absolutely obvious that within Germany the Kremlin uh, works uh, with, uh, with the right uh, forces. Альтернативы для Германии, Липен и все вот эти силы, они используются для дестабилизации и для ударов по Евросоюзу. Альтернативы для Германии, Липен, используются для дестабилизации и для атаки на Европейскую Союзу. Спасибо вам большое за нашу панель и спасибо всем, кто пришел.